Okay, so hi everyone. We are Yuri and Stav, and we do malware research for Mandiant, and we are very excited to be here. During our session, we will describe the evolution of an all-time favorite Chinese APT and its mission in Israel, or you might say that we will focus on the fjords. So, in our agenda today, first we'll talk about Chinese cyberspace in general and the ANC 215, which is their representative for the Middle East and Israel. Then we will discuss how they use old vulnerabilities to great effect. We will talk about just how fragile our networks are from the inside. We will continue discussing the modus operandi of ANC215, how they evolve their malware and their engineering skills, and then we will conclude everything. So, without further ado, <laughs> let's talk about what happens when a Chinese actor makes Aliyah to the Holy Land. <laughs> First and foremost, what is in Chinese cyberspace? So, they target pretty much everyone. We see them in the US, in Europe, internal targeting in China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and naturally the Middle East. So we are breaking down this huge term. Dozens of threat actors. We see pretty much any and every motivation. We see cyber espionage, cyber crime, info ops. However, the key drivers we usually see is them being concerned about their territorial integrity, regime stability, and how they increase their influence in their region and around the world. So why Israel? China invested billions of dollars in Israeli startups, partnered or bought companies in key industries, such as semiconductors and artificial intelligence. Also, as part of the Belt and Road Initiative, they have crucial projects in Israel, and they pretty much own a rail and two ports. So they have plenty of interest in Israel. And where the Chinese have interests, they spy. And who would do that for them? Well, meet ANC215. This is a group that has been active since 2014. We have low confidence that they're a distant cousin of APT27. They have global targeting, but they have a special focus on the Middle East. And we see them in places like Iran, Turkey, and naturally in Israel. They're interested in governments, in health, in defense sector. And in general, this is a pretty cool actor with great OPSEC and exceptional tradecraft. Let's talk briefly about their classic toolkit to establish a baseline for further discussion. This is an actor of one-day vulnerabilities. They like to use simple web shells like China Chopper. They have a distinct loading chain which ends with a uniquely packed shell code we call Silkrap. And they have two signature malwares, the Focus Fjord Downloader and the Hyperbro Backdoor. Following this short intro, I think we can now begin the journey of ANC 215's evolution throughout its mission in Israel. I would like to begin where any good operation would have started, and that's gaining initial access with exploitation, or if you'd like, lack of patching. Now, as of today, we've created this zero-day worshipment culture where we are constantly terrified for the next amazing zero-day and the next state-sponsored actor that would bring its amazing zero-day to us. We're constantly chasing the next big thing and neglecting all their vulnerabilities and our protection from them. Now, I don't do vulnerability research or collect data that's related to it, but some people do just that, so we can look at their facts even though you might have think that breaches these days would leverage newer vulnerabilities, we can see that the older ones are actually leading the way. Even the CISA, which would usually be the first to warn us from these oh-so-incredible zero days, would actually come and say, well, you know what? These state-sponsored actors, they would not only leverage one days, but even five years old ones. When serving organizations that were breached, you can see that most of them were breached using vulnerabilities that a patch to was available but was not applied. And was that a surprise to them? No, these organizations knew they were vulnerable. But they can definitely explain why it happened. 
It's because patching for these vulnerabilities is a burden. It requires time and resources, and it does not always go right because not all patches are stable. So we tend to procrastinate it, and then when we will finally do so, we would usually prioritize the most brutally externally facing areas of our networks or assets that we feel are important or interesting. But procrastination does not pay off in this case. Let's review one of ANC215's all-time favorite one-day vulnerabilities. We'll discuss CVE 2019-0604. It was disclosed by Microsoft during February of 2019 and was patched by them during end of March of the same year. It's a vulnerability for Microsoft SharePoint servers. What happens is that there is some improper validation of user-supplied data to the encoder class of the SharePoint, meaning that the attacker can now send any serialized XML payload it desires, which would then in turn be deserialized, and the content from the XML would be executed as OS commands on the victim's environment. Now, we have observed ANC215 beginning to use this vulnerability during March of 2019. This makes perfect sense, because at the time, the patch for it is not available or very fresh, but POCs are already publicly available. What is interesting is that we see these guys absolutely peaking with it all the way into 2020, only to then use it to pawn Israeli government entities a year after patch release pawning Israeli government organizations. But this is a relatively easy CVE to exploit. So of course that it gained great popularity with many threat actors, and not just ANC215. So what did differ our actor from any other plain Jane that was using it? Well, ANC215 decided to go against the flow and against the publicly available POCs. Where most exploitation examples for this CVE would leverage the HTTP POST method, meaning that most detection mechanisms for this vulnerability would search for these type of requests, ANC215 used the GET method in order to send GET requests that has content, which would usually be just a small China Chopper web shell payload. They were forced to add the entity separator field to the request with a unique string value to it. This started as a very clever way of this actor to attempt and avoid detection while using an extremely popular vulnerability. But it actually ended up helping us identify them better. Because now, during any investigation where we would encounter this specific CVE leveraged with get requests, the entity separator field, and this value, we could almost immediately attribute to ANC215. Now, this actor was able to leverage this vulnerability in such late timing because in any target they got to, they could find at least one server that was not properly patched because it's not interesting or nobody will find it or that they will do it tomorrow for sure. We can now proceed from gaining initial access and exploitation towards our internal networks and internally facing assets. We're at this point in an operation, our actor has to base its stance in the network, remain persistent, and spread on further. Now, fortunately for threat actors, networks these days are still built like M&Ms. They are crispy on the outside, but soft and mellow in the middle. We've mentioned that we know we have gaps in areas like patching, but again, this is only referring to externally facing areas of our networks. We would usually not even discuss internally facing ones. These are areas where we usually feel safer and like we can't be touched. We can look quickly at monitoring agendas, for instance, as any organization would very closely track anything attempting to penetrate from the outside and would very closely monitor anything attempting to leak from its organization. But what happens if something makes it past these main entries and exits? We're living in this misconception that if we guard the gates, nothing can barge in. 
To me, this misconception is even more interesting these days, where any cybersecurity article or post would mention the words zero trust. But we do trust everything in our networks, right? So to show us how wrong we are and how dangerous this complacency towards defending and monitoring internal assets can be, ANC215 rises to the occasion. For this, I would like to circle back to the Focus Fjord. We've mentioned that this is a first-stage downloader. It is delivered to the host via a unique loading chain, making sure that the backdoor is only opened in memory. It essentially has one job. It will establish a connection with a C2 that can either be hard-coded or found in a dedicated configuration on the victim's host, and then just wait to receive a next stage payload and load it. The Focus Fjord is a super safe and stable way for our actor to remain accessible to infected endpoints without making too much noise and just update its toolkit from time to time as needed because that's a downloader. But when can the Focus Fjord stop being so safe and stable? In first case, one of the binaries belonging to said loading chain might be caught and quarantined. But we will get back to this issue. Second case, which we will now focus on, is what happens if this connection between the Focus Yard C2 and the infected endpoint is detected and blocked. Well, ANC215 will now show us their attempt of solving this issue once and for all. During our investigations for government and high-tech Israeli victims, we began to collect our evidence. We, of course, gathered new Focus Yard binaries. When opening them, we could immediately notice that in opposed to previous variants that only supported communication over HTTPS, we can now see five supported communication protocols. So we see now HTTP, HTTPS, TCP, UDP, and auto. I think we can all agree we know what the first four are. But what is auto? Well, it turns out this is a custom binary protocol crafted by ANC215, then implemented into the Focus Yard backdoor. I would like to refer to it as the Proxy Fjord Protocol from now on. The Proxy Fjord Protocol enables our actor to minimize its outbound footprint to the very, very bare minimum by implementing an internal CNC hierarchy. What happens now is that this actor can breach the network, then deploy between one to two instances of the backdoor. These would be called the externally configured Focus Fjords. They will be configured to use a real C2 address and a real protocol like HTTPS. The actor can now proceed and deploy as many additional instances of the backdoor in the network as it desires. These would be called the internally configured focus fjords. For C2, they will use the addresses of the endpoints where the externally configured instances are installed. For protocol, they will leverage the proxy fjord. So now the majority of the malicious focus fjord communication is happening inside the organizational network via internal IP addresses belonging to the spawned organization, making this entire thing almost impossible to detect unless you monitor your internal network, which almost nobody does. Only between one to two endpoints in the entire network now will go out to a real internet-facing C2. I want to go over a quick example for how Proxy Fjord actually looks like in real life. Now, this example was taken out of one of our victims' environments, and this is a decrypted packet because um, communication inside the network is encrypted. We can see it's consisted of three parts. The first is the internally configured focus fjord given details about himself. This is where I'm installed, this is my host name, and this is the C2 I would like to use. Second part is saved for results of commands execution. 
Third part is intended to the externally configured instance. It has details like use this protocol, use this C2, and use this network identifier so our operator can know who we are. This is a very typical behavior for ANC215 because this actor knows it already has reliable knowledge and infrastructure to operate the focus your backdoor. So it would now make just the right changes to it to help it avoid detection rather than attempting to develop completely new tools and techniques. At this point, this actor now gained initial access. It definitely based its stance inside the network. So it's time that we arrive to the peak of the operation. At this point, our actor has to deliver hardcore backdoors to the field. It's time to engage in data collection and exfiltration activities. And it's mainly time to do all that without attracting any unnecessary attention. Now, we have been tracking ANC215 for quite some time now. So we can say that these guys have three main modes of operation arriving to this point. First mode is comfort zone. This is a seasoned actor. It knows it has very reliable infrastructure backdoors and techniques that had been serving it faithfully for years now. So they should not be replaced as long as they work. Second mode is what happens when these so trustworthy malwares and techniques are not so trustworthy anymore. And then at this point, this actor is under great pressure and might suffer. Binary is crushing and being quarantined and has to deliver quick fixes to the field during real time. Third mode is when ANC215 would demonstrate us their exceptional development skills and would introduce completely new backdoors to avoid just these high-pressure situations for important targets, all while staying true to their origins. We will now go into further details of each mode. So comfort zones. For me, I would have to say that the first significant comfort zone for ANC215 would be their unique loading chain used to deliver their malwares. It consists of three binaries that must all be present in the same path to achieve successful execution. The first is a legit binary vulnerable to DLL side loading. This actor would abuse that, obviously, to sideload a loader DLL. When executed, it would initiate a XOR decoding routine and then open parts of himself. It will then proceed to read and load the third and final component, which is a pack shellcode. The shellcode for this packer is called Silkrap and is custom made by our actor. Silkrap enables to hide compressed payloads in a shell shellcode. When opening it, we would usually find one of two backdoors, either a focus field or a hyperbro, which is a very robust backdoor offering many capabilities, such as execution of CMD commands, enumeration and termination of processes, and files, downloads, and uploads. Second prominent comfort zone for ANC215 would have to be their unique backdoor configuration storing mechanism. Upon first delivery of both backdoors, they will contain a clear text configuration block. It will have information like C2 addresses, parts of encryption keys, and paths for files of the loading chain. Now, upon first execution, these blocks would be stored under dedicated config registry entries. Now, these entries would be different for the two malware families and would sometimes even be different for variants of the same backdoor. Now, Hyperbro would just store its configuration as is and will continue its execution. Focus Fjord would encrypt its configuration prior to storing it and then afterwards will rewrite itself without this block and restart its execution to eliminate any infrastructure or attribution-related evidence in later stages. Now, in most cases, these techniques and the two backdoors would be 
more than enough for our actor to have a successful operation. But sometimes, though, they're not. We saw for investigations, for super high-profile Israeli victims, that at some point, binaries belonging to loading chains of both backdoors began to be detected and quarantined by EDRs and Windows Defender services. This is a huge problem for ANC 215 at this point, because first of all, they might lose access to very important victims. Second of all, these quarantine alerts, they might create noise and catch the attention of defenders in the network. Spoiler alert, it didn't catch anybody's attention. Lastly, as we've mentioned, loading chains must be complete of all three binaries to successfully operate. So when one file is quarantined, the others are attempting to execute, crashing, and creating even more unnecessary noise. Well, ANC 215 will now demonstrate their incredible three-phase plan to solve this issue. First phase would be patching the Focus Fjord. This is a small backdoor, so there is not much to change in it. So our actor compiles dedicated third-party utilities to support it from the side. The first utility we've seen is dubbed the Fjordo Helper. It can allow the actor to access and update the Focus Yard's registry configuration, and by doing that, fixing broken loading chains. In case of this actor is super desperate, it just want to avoid being detected and attributed, Fjordo Helper can eliminate all Focus Yard related evidence from the host and delete all binaries, persistent, and services. Second utility we've observed is called the Proxy Fjord, which I think at this point we're all familiar with this term. The Proxy Fjord utility is essentially the communication function of the Focus Fjord compiled into a standalone binary. Now that our actor has its internal CNC hierarchy, using the Proxy Fjord, it can replace backdoor instances with the utility instances. By decreasing the number of backdoors in the network, it can decrease its chances of being detected. Second phase would be stopping the hyperbro quarantines. Now, we've said that this is a much larger backdoor. So ANC215 now take their shot and attempt to upgrade the entire thing. They will begin by switching the vulnerable legit binary. They will accordingly change the name of the loader DLL. Then, for good measures, they will even add capabilities to the backdoor to make it even more noticeable. Well, this, of course, was a huge mistake, because not even 30 minutes after introduction to the field of the upgraded variant, it was quarantined again. ANC215 are now in great trouble, because first of all, they might be detected and attributed. They might lose access to these so important victims, and at this point, they might also lose their heads. So they realize they have no choice but to disable all EDRs and Windows Defender services for these hosts. They will look for solutions of how to access protected processes in the OS and will head to where any good developer in need will go, Stack Overflow or Git. Luckily, today, there is this great abundance of supported providers of vulnerable drivers and Git repositories that offer just that. But you can see this one behind me is very new and, and is being updated as we speak. ANC215 will opt for something more vintage. They will choose the Striker project from 2018, leveraging a CVE from 2017. We assume they did that because as this actor appreciate its trustworthy techniques and tools that had been with him for years, they know that a repository that is tank stable from 2018 is far more tried and tested than something that was compiled yesterday. Now, Striker Project 
is leveraging two third-party drivers, a vulnerable one and a used one, in order to do things like hijack protected processes and load unsigned drivers. ANC215 will now compile a brand new malware based on this project called ANTI. Following execution of ANTI on hosts in the field, we could see event logs mentioning that indeed all EDR were terminated and all Windows Defender services were stopped, meaning this was not only properly planned, but actually worked. So we have now seen ANC215 in their comfort zone. We have also seen that when push comes to shove, they develop ad hoc solutions to stay on high profile victims. Nevertheless, although we accumulated a knowledge of Striker, their signature malware still got detected and quarantined, which pushed them to develop a new framework, which would be more stealthy and more robust. They would up their game and move finally from user mode to kernel space. Now, this new framework is rather complex, so bear with me as I go over the details. While we were looking for their signature loading chain, we found something new. Now first, their loading chain would start as a service. Next, while they also used the registry as before, it contained much more than just some configs. So the payload would be decoded from the shell code, and then it would go to the registry and decode yet another loader, in memory only, which would start a whole new execution chain. Now, we know they like to use Striker, so we looked, and unsurprisingly, we found the two legitimate drivers that Striker references. However, they didn't use Striker out of the box. They decided to change it, upgrade it, to make it more robust. And also, interestingly, their loader would start with dumping a log file, clear text, hidden in plain sight, which would log every step of the loading chain. So helpful to me. <laughs> now, uh, it then would go and extract a shellcode from registry. It would load the vulnerable CPU Z driver. It would then load the abused sysinternals driver. Then it would use the CPU Z vulnerability to scan the entire physical space for the specific bytes of the specific dispatch handler of the specific version of the sysinternals driver they were using. Once found, they would copy aside the legitimate code and overwrite it with above-mentioned shellcode. They would then issue a specific IO control to the driver and trigger the shellcode. The shellcode, in turn, would unpack and load an unsigned driver into non-mapped, unmapped, and non-paged kernel space. Now, unlike Striker, these guys, they like clean work. So immediately after usage, they restored their legitimate code to the abused driver. And naturally, they safely unloaded the legitimate drivers to avoid any potential blue screens. Now, what does this driver do? This is a filter driver. However, as you might know, if you try to register a callback in your filter driver to unmapped kernel space, some Windows 10 mitigations might complain. Now, to avoid just that, they would put a small trampoline overwriting legitimate but unused code in TCP IP driver. And then the callback goes to mapped space, and execution proceeds to their driver later. Now, what does their filter driver filter? Well, they protect the framework's components. First and foremost, they protect the files and the loading chain. Then they protect the registry keys. And third, they protect ELSAS from dumping or access. Now, why would they do that? Spoiler, not in order to protect the victim from Mimikatz. Now, they inject a fully functional backdoor into ELSAS. We have seen a trend with this actor of trying to minimize their outbound footprint. This is no exception. 
and they would try to masquerade as a legitimate web server. They would register a filter with their driver that would listen on incoming traffic. Once there is an incoming packet to a specific legitimate-looking URI, and that has a specific magic value in its headers, it would store the command, and then the backdoor from Elsas would retrieve it later. Once the backdoor is done with its business and wants to send a reply, it would issue an IO control to the driver, which would in turn inject directly onto TCP stack the reply using the Windows filtering platform, avoiding any standard Windows APIs that are usually monitored. Another pretty cute thing we've seen with this framework is that their log file remains unprotected on disk. The second thing about this log file is that they use the word test a lot. Now, they have used the word test in previous versions of this framework. While we don't really think that this framework is still in its testing phases, we are pretty sure that the developers, at least, think this is not even their final form. <laughs> So let's discuss a bit the similarities and, their, and them remaining true to their origins and the differences between this framework and what we've previously seen by this actor. In both cases, they use registry to store artifacts. But here, they, they stole a whole loading chain worth of components. components. <laughs> both use the same classic loading chain. However, in this case, they used host name based guardrail. Their loading chain would actually execute properly only on the specific host name it was designed for and compiled for. It would not decode on any other host. Both use stealthy backdoors, but these are much stealthier with the same capabilities. We have seen this driver used before, open on disk. Well, I guess they decided it's better to have it open only in memory. So let's conclude everything that we've been up to so far. So first and most obvious, I think we've definitely established that China spies on Israel. We've demonstrated how threat actors can take advantage of evident weaknesses in our defense mechanisms and in our patterns as defenders that globally repeat themselves. Now, we've shown that ANC215 is an actor that invests greatly into development of its tools and malware and in ensuring best possible OPSEC to its operations, rather than just chasing the next big zero-day research. Moreover, this actor would not only put its resources towards development and not research, but would also make sure to always have the solutions with best value for money by opting to upgrade and maintain already existing infrastructure and backdoors rather than trying to invent new things all the time. Now, given the amount of effort and attention put up by ANC215 towards these Israeli operations, we can say that the Chinese, they don't just spy on Israel as a side project, but have dedicated resources to it and have great significance to this area and that we will for sure continue to see them operating here, implementing even more tools and techniques. Well, I can now finish by giving you a great punch of how you should be aware of Chinese hackers. But we have to remember that during these operations, we've had multiple opportunities to make it harder and more difficult for this actor to achieve its goals. We could have patched our assets, we could have monitored our internal networks, we could have paid attention to quarantine alerts, but we didn't do all that. So while it's easy to go and blame others, we have to remember that when we point our fingers at someone, there are three pointing right back at us. Thank you. Thank you.